what makes a great life? You know, while we're talking about it, what, what is one like? Uh, great lives usually are described as people who have developed great character. Character is strong moral character. My daddy always said that character was what you are when nobody's looking. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? It's what you are when nobody's looking. That's what your character is. Um, how do you develop character? How do you grow a good character? Uh, that's what we used to talk a lot about in America. And when I was growing up, we wanted to grow people with strong moral characters. And uh, Well, I looked up in Wikipedia what character is. And it's character, moral, strong moral character in our young people. And then uh, grow, stay with it all of our lives. Because, friends, listen, you cannot legislate morality. Now think about that. As much as we want our politicians uh, to, to provide good laws and policies, you cannot legislate true morality. It has to be in, implanted in the heart of children and then lived by for, for all of our life because you simply cannot force it any other way. An American was visiting Argentina one time he's talked with the president of Argentina and he said sir why do you think South America has gotten on so poorly and North America has done so well he says how do you explain the difference between the two continents or the uh, it's because one's done well one's not done, not done so well he said what do you think the reason is and then the the, uh, the uh, fellow uh, from Argentina said he was the president of the Republic and he said this I think the reason is found in the fact that the Spaniards came to South America seeking gold. And the pilgrims came to America seeking God. Yes. And so those that contrast will let you help you see, I think, why we've done so well in North America. Because our, our forefathers came here trying to get closer to God. And and they do they developed those moral character qualities that that we've built a, our nation upon and that has lasted and, and made such a strong uh, place to live up until now. Now, tonight we're going to be talking about character. Growing and moral character. Character. Now, we're going to be using for our scripture uh, Genesis chapter 37. And now that we're going to be watching the children of Israel as they grow up and develop moral character. We're going to be focusing on the life of Joseph. Now, as we look into the life of Joseph, one of the things that, that really comes out strongly to us is the character, the strong moral character that Joseph had. What an example he is. What a model for us to live our lives by, by this young man named Joseph. Now, some of the brothers of, of the children of Israel, some have already been involved in a revenge murder following the rape of, of their sister Dinah. Uh, the, the, the family is showing signs of greatness and signs of moral weakness. They're, you know, it's not perfectly uh, coming up even, evenly. In other words, they're showing some good signs and some bad signs. And, and so we're going to watch, we need to analyze Joseph's life to see where this moral character came from. Where did Joseph get such a strong dose of moral character? And, and uh, where did this come from? Because as, as we answer that question for Joseph tonight, we may be answering it for ourselves. How do we grow strong moral character? And how do we retain it and, and maintain it all through our life? One way that we talk about moral character, uh, another way to describe it, is having a moral compass. It is that like it keeps us. What keeps us balanced with our moral compass? In other words, why do we care how we live? Why does it matter how we live among each other? What is that moral compass, and where do we get it, and how do we set it? Um, so a strong moral compass is possible for every person. Everybody can have it. You can have that moral character and that compass that you need. But there are some things that you have to overcome. I believe that, that uh, there are stumbling blocks, things that get in the way of all of our lives that keep us from growing the kind of character we need to grow. So we're going to look into the life of Joseph, into his family, his interactions between his brothers, 
and uh, watch how they interacted with each other and see if we can determine how Joseph grew such a strong character. Because you're going to be amazed at him as we follow his life and watch him perform and do life uh, when nobody's looking. And, and, for instance. Now the first thing I'm going to notice, bring to your attention tonight is that uh, Joseph, Joseph had to had to overcome negative childhood influences. There was a lot of negative stuff that happened to him. Uh, and some of you tonight have had really bad experiences as a, in your childhood. Uh, I uh, feel sorry for you if you're over 40 and you're still depending on, uh, on if you're still holding on to some negative childhood experience. Could I just say to you, grow up? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Come and get over it. Okay. Quit hanging on to that and blaming somebody right. for something. I mean, it, it, you, it's, you've had enough time to set it right. So we's, we're going to look then at Joseph's uh, 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 strong moral compass and figure out how he got it. So he, he overcame a lot of negative influences. The first influence I want to talk about was an unbalanced family preference. In other words, some of the boys and some of the children were preferred over some of the other. Now it's hard, it's easy to understand that because daddy wanted to marry the beautiful wife, remember? But, uh, but he, he said he got tricked and he, and he woke up the next morning with, not, with the wife that wasn't so pretty. His father-in-law substituted brides after it got dark, so he, he thought he went to bed with, with one and woke up with the other. So then later he married the pretty wife and uh, then the pretty wife couldn't have kids. <laughs> And, and then the, the, other, the not so pretty wife, she started having kids and, and then they both kind of stopped. So they, then he, not married, but took into the family their handmaidens their, their, of, his, of his wives. And so he had four women bearing children for him. Two of them were, uh, he married, two he didn't. They were just part of the family. And so you could see how their children came up with an unbalanced preference. Some were loved more than others. Some were not loved as much as others. Anybody here had an experience like that in your family where well, some of the family got more of the more love than the others? See, that's the way it is in my family. Lonnie gets it all. <laughs> we don't know how we're going to survive. Mama loves him the most. I <laughs> and and uh, it really hurts all the rest of us. <laughs> So let's look at how to deal with this unbalanced preference in the family. Let's read chapter 37, just a little bit over here. Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flock with his brothers, the sons of, now get it down, his brothers, the sons of Bilal, the, the maid, the, the servant, and the sons of Zilpah, another servant his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Okay, so Joseph was out here working with the, the kids in the family, and he came back and he tattletailed to Daddy. He said, Daddy, i got to tell you, these boys are goofing off. They're not doing their job. They're not working hard. When your back's turned, they take a nap or whatever. They're just, they're worthless, you know. So he tattletailed to his daddy. And that really didn't set him up very good with the family. Uh, tattletales, you know, they just, they were going to get even with him. So they didn't like it. Uh, so he got this unbalanced uh, thing going here. And, and Joseph was, was working it really good. He was getting uh, a much, much of the appreciation and the love, more than the rest. <clears throat> now another thing that I noticed here is that the unbalanced family preference was then they had preferential treatment and jealousy. This was going on in the family. Again, some were getting treated better than others. And everybody was jealous. Let's read verse 3. Verse 3. <clears throat> now Israel loved Joseph. Israel was the daddy. Okay. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his, of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age. And he made him an ornate robe I made an ornate robe for him. And when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, 
They hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. <clears throat> well, old people have more time to raise their kids than you do when you're young. Uh, my wife and I have jokingly said many times, God knows when to give you your kids when they're young, when you're young. When you get older, you don't have... You know, things are different, but when they're older, they had more time. They had a little bit more money. They had a little bit more perspective on life. And, and what resulted was they showed a little bit more appreciation for the kids born later in life. And that's sad, and, uh, but, but you know, that's, that's common. Uh, some of you have experienced that, I'm sure, that, that you were born uh, and, and you're, some of your kids' children maybe got better treatment than you did or you feel like it. But nevertheless, that's part of it. And, and uh, again, let me say, get over it. You know, yeah. Get over it. You can't keep going away. But jealousy can tear a family to pieces. Oh, my. Jealousy just can destroy a family. And, and they think one's getting a better deal here, one got a better deal here, and uh, they, they really it really messes up. I think what we need to do as parents is to do our best to love our children equally and give them the, a blessing equally, and not to pour on one and take it away from the other. My wife and I, we always tell whatever child we're with or whatever grandkid we're with, we love them the best. <laughs> We always tell them that. Yeah. And, but they know that. They know They know that's what we tell. We tell everybody that. <clears throat> but well, we try to keep it real even. Wife goes to great lengths to make sure that the Christmas presents are balanced and, and the birthday presents are balanced and, because we want to keep that balance in our family. We don't want to be jealous of each other. So the next thing I want you to notice is that uh, there was a lot of prejudice and judgment in the family. They were prejudiced toward one another. The, the sons born of the, the preferred wives were prejudiced to those born of the not preferred wives. And, and there, was, there was this constant uh, bickering, I'm sure, that went on in the family. But it was creating a great, great dis, uh, disunity in the family. Let's look at, at how some of this prejudice and how this judgment plays out. Join me in verse 5. Joseph had a dream. Remember, Joseph is the boy we're talking about. One with the, the in the King James it calls it the coat of many colors. And Dolly, Dolly Parton had a song, you know, oh, she does a good job on that, the coat of many colors. But it was some kind of a special coat that he made. But let's, let's read verse 5. Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheep rose and stood upright while your sheep gathered around mine and bowed down to it. That's going to win friends and influence people. <clears throat> Verse 8, His brother said to him, well, Do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he said. Then he had another dream. Now what enough? He had another one. And he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream. This time the sun and the moon and eleven stars were bowing down to me. When he told his father as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. So we have this this thing here of, of, of different visions of life. One saw that he was going to be exalted. Now by the way, in case you haven't read the story, the rest of it, that is exactly what happened. He left, he, he went, the family sent him away, we're going to cover it a little bit, but the family sent him away. He was adopted or bought by uh, a uh, fellow in Egypt and finally became the property of the, one of the leaders of the whole nation of Egypt. And in time, Joseph became second in command in the nation of Egypt. So he really did rise to the top. And, and everything he dreamed and visioned here, it came true. But probably wisdom would teach us sometimes to keep our dreams to ourselves. 
especially if it includes uh, uh, how you're going to be so much better than somebody in your family. That might be something you might want to keep quiet. Well, let's follow now, starting in verse 5, and notice that there was some other bad stuff happening in the family, and the family uh, has insults, violence, and anger. Had anybody here raising a family that had, was insulting to each other? Maybe there was some family violence and anger. Don't raise your hands. <laughs> but, but there, some of you had to live with that. Some of you had to grow up in homes where you were abused, where uh, you were disciplined, not in love, but in anger. And uh, my heart goes out to you. Let's read verse 12. Okay. Now his brothers had gone to graze their father's flock near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, As you know, your brothers are grazing the flocks near Shechem. Come, I'm going to send you to them. Very well, he replied. So he said to him, Go and see if all is well with your brothers and with the flocks and bring word back to me. Then he sent him off to the valley of Hebron. And when Joseph arrived at Shechem, a man found him wandering around in the fields and asked him, What are you looking for? He replied, I'm looking for my brothers. Can you tell me where they're grazing their flocks? Well, they've moved on from here, the man answered. I heard them say, Let's go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan. And, but, when he saw, but, when, but they saw him in the distance. And before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and, and say that a ferocious animal devoured him and devoured him and then we'll see what comes of his dreams. So here's what happened. <clears throat> the family follows. The brothers had had enough of him and they plotted to kill him. And they said, we're going to kill him and tell Dad that he died by, because a, a wild animal attacked him, a bear or a lion or something attacked him and killed him and uh, we're just going to tell dad that's what happened but the truth of it is we're going to kill him we're tired of it now another thing that that uh, joseph had to overcome besides violence and, and this insulting lifestyle he also had to deal with a lack of family unity this family wasn't unified they didn't have a common goals they didn't have common desires they didn't have things that they wanted to accomplish in common. And this is the ultimate family of God. This is the family God is going to use to bring the whole nation of Israel into, into bear. He's going to bring all through these people. And they were not unified. The brothers didn't get along with each other. Uh, nobody got along. They played tricks on each other. They, there was mistreatment and preference. There was just a lack of family unity. So I'm going to say to you tonight, if you are in a family that is disunified, uh, that's not God's plan. God wants your family to be at peace, to have common goals, to have things that you want to accomplish together. And, uh, and But if you are disunified, the only way to find a un unified vision is to find it in the Lord. Now, let's look at what the family did here. Uh, let's this is going to show you a little bit about their disunity. Now, when Reuben is one of the brothers, one well, of the older brothers. When Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into the sister here in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and take him back to his father. So Reuben wanted to save his life. Reuben said, don't kill him. Just throw him into this dry cistern. A cistern is a, a well, a dug well, but this was didn't have any water in it. So just throw him in there. But Reuben was planning to get him out and take him home to dad. So, verse 23, So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe he was wearing. And they took him and threw him into the cistern. The cistern was empty. There was no water in it. And as they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices, balm and myrrh, and they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. Ju Judah, another older brother, said to his brothers, What will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's just sell him to these Ishmaelites and, and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. His brothers agreed. 
So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph about the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. Now when Reuben returned to the cistern and saw that Joseph was not there, he tore his clothes. He went back to his brother and said, the boy isn't there. Where can I turn now? Let's go back and, and look into this just a little bit. Their, their hearts had become so hard that when they threw the brother into the well, notice what they did? They sat down and had lunch. Like there's nothing to them. They just sat down and had lunch. Now Reuben was trying to save the day and, and Reuben came later and found that, that he was gone and he was all upset and worried because he really wanted to save that boy but the, older bro the other brothers had sold him to, to Egypt and there he was gone. So he had to come overcome a lot of family disunity and uh, then another thing he had to come overcome was lies and deception. Boy, human beings, we're really good at that. We're so good at lying to each other, deceiving each other. But listen carefully to me. That is not Christian character. The character of a believer, a true Christ follower, is one that does not tell lies, does not bear false witness, and does not deceive each other. It says, the Bible says, let your, let your word be enough, let your yes be yes, and your no be no. Uh, we ought to be the kind of people that can go into a contract with each other or with uh, people outside of our faith. And our handshake ought to be enough. Boy, there was a time in America, and I remember as a child, that's enough. Neighbors agreed on cattle or selling land or building a fence or whatever. They shook hands on it. And that's enough. Boy, well, today you need three or four lawyers you know, to do anything with it. So there's a lot of lying and deceiving going on. Let's read verse 31. Then they got Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat, and dipped the blood, the robe in the blood. They took the ornate robe back to their father and said, We found this. Examine it. See whether it's your son's robe. He recognized it and said, It is my son's robe. Some ferocious animal has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. Now I want you to notice that Dad's heart was torn out here. Daddy loved that boy. He loved all of his boys. But he loved this boy. And his heart was broken. And so one of the things that you had to get by with was lies and deception. But also, then there's another thing, and that is getting past great loss. The losing of things. You know, when you get mature, when you get grown up, you've gone through so much loss. You've had to experience grief. A grief is always defined as, as loss. You know, we grieve over the loss of health. We grieve over the loss of hair. You know, we, we grieve over the loss of, of anything. You know, when you lose a loved one, you, it's, it's a loss, but, but grief is what occurs because of that. We, we've experienced loss, and we've experienced grief. And, and there's hardly a person ever gets to maturity or middle age in life that hasn't experienced a lot of loss. And you've been there too. But our character is developed in spite of great loss, in spite of, of grief. That it, it, it goes on, and, and we develop it. So, Joseph, verse 34, Then Jacob, the old father, tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and daughters came to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. No, he said, I'll continue to mourn until I join my son in the grave. So his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. So we begin to see how that he's set up then for this, uh, this perfect uh, rise to power. This is a story about a man and how he developed character. He went through all these things and it didn't make him bitter. You see, when you, when you experience great difficulty and pain, you have an option. You can get better or you can get bitter. See, when you get better, you, you get better by developing loyalty, character strengths, honesty. Uh, you develop these things 
and it grows a strong moral character in your life. Please be aware that nobody, nobody has a perfect childhood or family experience. There are no such things as a functional family. Everyone is just a little bit dysfunctional yeah. in one way or another. Yeah. So don't use that as a crutch. If you've been in a dysfunctional family, I've said it three times now, get over it. Yeah. You know, it's time to grow up and, and, and develop your own strength. Every family has some in one way or another. And everybody has to deal with some loss. So stop blaming your family or somebody else for the things that have happened to you. Stop being a victim. As long as you continue to be a victim, it's going to be hard to develop character. But when you, when you grow a backbone and you stand up strong and, and you take responsibility for your life and you stop blaming your mom and your daddy or your, your family or some bad experience, when you stand up strong, that's when you start growing a strong moral character. And that's what you will be want to be remembered for. You want to be remembered for someone who stood for something, who wasn't blown and tossed by the winds of life. So stop blaming. Stand up. Stop being a victim. Get past it and be responsible for your life. Take responsibility for your life. When you get to heaven, I imagine God will laugh if we say, well, the reason I live such a poor life is because... Uh, you know, everybody messed with me. I didn't know. He said, well, how long did you live past that? Stop being a victim. Be responsible. If this nation of America could stand up and take responsibility for our individual lives, we would have so few problems as a nation. We'd have so few problems financially and, and with all the kinds of things that we do to try to, to become that nanny state that we're becoming, you know. If people would stand up on their own two feet to take responsibility for their lives, this would be and would continue to be a great nation for years to come. But we've decided, sadly, that we just want to be a, a nation of victims. My, somebody else needs to be responsible for me. I don't want to be responsible for myself. No nation can survive that. No character will ever be grown thinking like that. Stop being a victim. Be responsible. Let's pray.